So today I'm preaching on Pentecost Sunday, and the title of my message is We Need More Power. <clears throat> Pentecost is usually 50 days after the Passover, so according to the Jewish calendar, we're a few days off. But the Gentile church or the New Testament church has adopted the day of Pentecost as kind of a holiday, a high holiday in our churches, and we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. You see, for Israel, Pentecost was a grain harvest. For the church, Pentecost was a harvest of the Spirit. Because of Pentecost, we reap a harvest with the power to be a witness, the ability to be renewed and transformed, and the ability to live a life of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because of Pentecost, His power is abundantly available to us that believe. We are a Pentecostal church. Whether you believe that or not, we, we are. Some of you may not have any idea what that means. But we are a Pentecostal church. That means we identify and seek after the fullness of the Spirit just as they did at Pentecost. I believe that we need a harvest of the Spirit of God in our lives once again. As witnesses, we can't afford to stop seeking after being filled with the Holy Spirit. As a church, we can't afford to remain the same and not be transformed and renewed. As His children, we can't not be in His presence daily. We as a church need the Pentecostal power now more than ever. So I want to talk to you about a few things today. And the first one is why we need power. We need power to be a witness. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and verses 8, verse 4 says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And then it goes on down in verse 8 that says, But you will receive power. <laughs> you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We need power in order to be effective witnesses. There was a lady who went to a jeweler, and she had her watch with her, and it had stopped working, and she couldn't figure it out. She gave it to the jeweler. He looked at it. He stepped into the back room. He was gone maybe two minutes. He comes back, hands her the watch, and it's working perfectly. And she was so surprised, she goes, how did you fix that so fast? He said, well, lady, it just needed a new battery. And she said, battery? Nobody said about a, anything about a battery when I bought this thing. I've been winding it every morning. You see, a lot of Christians don't realize the inner power of the Holy Spirit to handle things that they think they have to take into their own hands. Sometimes we're trying to wind ourselves up Instead of just allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to have freedom to move and empower us and give us the power and the boldness to be witnesses to those that need to hear the good news. Amen. When I preached about the armor of God and the shoes of the gospel of peace, there's a scripture that says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. When I look at my feet, that's why I wear boots, I don't think beautiful. But... The Bible says my feet are beautiful because I preach the good news. I don't care what you all say. <laughs> I guess it's mostly Tracy. She's the only one that sees my feet. You see, His power is available to us to complete the task before us in the harvest. And He wants us to complete the task in His power and not by our own power. You see... God had a calling on Shane's life. Until Shane submitted to the Holy Spirit to give him the power to step into that calling, Shane couldn't do it in his own power. If you think I can stand up here and preach every Sunday without the power of the Holy Spirit, you guys have got to be kidding yourselves. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that I'm able to effectively speak the words that God wants me to speak Sometimes I have brother so-and-so say, you need to preach on this, or you need to preach on that. 
And all I can tell them is I'm going to preach what the Holy Spirit lays on my heart every week to preach. Because if I step out of line with the Holy Spirit, then I am not going to be effective. My words are going to be powerless. If I go home and think John needs to be hearing a sermon on such and such sin, and I go home and I prepare a message just to preach to John, nobody else is going to get anything out of it, and John probably won't either. Because he's going to be like, who's he talking about? But because I seek after the Holy Spirit and I spend time in His presence and I say, Lord, show me and teach me the things that I need to share. And I tell you guys every week that I'm preaching to myself almost as much as I'm preaching to you guys because the Holy Spirit's dealing with me and I know if He can deal with me, He can deal with you guys too about some of the same things. And we may not be walking the exact same path, but the Holy Spirit has a way to make it that it still speaks to you. Because sometimes you'll come up and say, Greg, that was such a great message and this is what I got out of it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. That wasn't what I was talking about, but hey, you got it. Holy Spirit gave it to you. I'm not going to take it back. You can see from our text that God didn't dare ask His people to do His work without giving them the ability and power to do it. That's why He asked them not to leave Jerusalem until power came in the form of the Holy Spirit. You see, the message of verse 8 is simple. Apart from the Holy Spirit, no one can preach the Gospel as God wants them to do it. With the Holy Spirit, we can make a difference. You see, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, My message and my preaching were not wise, were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. If you guys based your Christian walks on my wisdom, I'm sorry. My nickname growing up, my dad called me Bear. And so when Tracy and I started dating and she heard my dad call me bear, she started to call me Pooh because she said I was a bear of very little brain. So if you're building your spiritual walk on your pastor's own wisdom, you're in trouble. You need to build your walk on the power of the Holy Spirit. And when I preach and when I teach, it's in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in my own wisdom or in my own ingenuity or my own personality. Yes, I add a little bit of my personality to it. I make you guys laugh. I try and relate with you because I want you to know we're in this together. (laughs) Just because my name's pastor doesn't mean I don't have problems. Just because my name's pastor doesn't mean I don't get bills. Now they just send them to Reverend Greg Marr instead of Greg Marr. And they think he's a pastor, so he should pay him on time. (laughs) Without the power of the Holy Spirit, the message of the gospel just rests on man's wisdom, and and that's going to fall short. You see, 2 Timothy 3 5 says that in the last days, the church will have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. That's just a different way of saying that the church will be putting more emphasis on the show. More emphasis on the external things of the kingdom. The lights, the fog machines. I know we just went to a men's conference. I didn't see any fog machines, but lots of lights, lots of flash. Holy Spirit can still work in that, but it can't be about that. But if we become a church that concentrates on the internal, the power of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit work in our lives instead of worrying about how the lights look up here, worried about how good we sound when we sing. The Bible says make a joyful noise. I've told you guys before, I get booed in the shower when I sing. So, And it's just me in there. Huh. 
God forbid we turn into a empty church that denies the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be like the New Testament church that saw the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a normal experience for the empowering of believers to preach the gospel. You see, Peter, before the Holy Spirit, Peter, after the Holy Spirit, 8,000 people got saved in a few days because of the Holy Spirit, not because of Peter's wisdom, not because of Peter's knowledge of the Word. It was because his words were filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be like the New Testament church that saw the Holy Spirit as a normal experience because they knew that they should understand that without Him, their ministry wouldn't make much difference. You see, the Holy Spirit had to come. It had to light that spark to start the church because the church age began on the day of Pentecost. The second reason we need power is to be transformed. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. In the King James, it says they were all in one accord. I didn't know the disciples had a Honda, but they were all in one accord. Okay, I won't joke in. Some of you young guys are like, What's an accord? When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Why was there a symbol of fire when the believers received the Holy Spirit? Because fire is a symbol of transformation, because fire changes Everything it touches. I don't know if it's just a boy thing, but if we could burn something when we were little kids, we would burn it. Just a (laughs) chance. (laughs) Okay, there's some girl pyros out there too. Because we want to see what happens, right? We want to see how it changes, what's going on. So let's look at some of the ways that the Holy Spirit is changing us by His fire. You see, the Holy Spirit took a group of fishermen, former prostitutes, ex-religious leaders, tax collectors, and various family members of Jesus, and He turned them into a united group that is called the church. If the Holy Spirit could take a former prostitute Foul-mouthed fishermen, angry guys, the sons of Zebedee were called the sons of thunder because they liked to fight all the time. If He can take them and change them into the church, what can He do with us? What can the power of the Holy Spirit change us into? We can become an instrument for Him that will bring back the revival that we need in our city, that we need in our community, that we need in our church, that we need in our individual lives to live the life of Christ every single day. Amen. You see, before Pentecost, the disciples were scared. They lacked faith. They scattered like sheep when Jesus went to the cross. They didn't fully understand God's plan. He didn't, they didn't understand what Jesus meant when He said this temple is going to be torn down and in three days I'm going to rebuild it. They ran. But after Pentecostal fire fell, they were united as they never were before. People say, oh Jesus, they just stole His body and hid it and just went on about life like Jesus was raised from the dead. But the Holy Spirit power, the deaths that those people died as martyrs, you think they would die that way over a a prank, a joke, a story they're trying to tell? 
they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they became welded together into a force that... Look at Big C Church all over the world. We not... <laughs> Unfortunately, because of factions in the big C church, some of them aren't operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. So they're just warming seats on Sunday mornings. But we as Pentecostals need to understand that the Holy Spirit power gives us the power to be effective in our communities. It gives us the power to be effective in our families. I keep talking about it. If we're so proud and happy to have salvation, why do we hold on to it ourselves and not share it with the ones we love? Share it with the ones that we want to see go to heaven with us. Why would we keep it from a stranger? Why would we want to see them see the flames of hell for any reason? But we can't be effective without the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, there was a blacksmith who had two pieces of iron and he wanted to weld them into one and he took them just as they were cold and hard and he put them together on the anvil and he swung his hammer, swung his hammer, swung his hammer and almost exhausted himself and he looked down and they were still two pieces of iron. And then at last he remembered what he should have never forgotten. And he took both pieces of iron and he put them into the fire. Then he took them out red hot, laid them on top of each other and it took just a few easy blows, and they became one piece of iron. What makes the work of the church today, what makes the church work in our day? It's the Spirit of God. You see, there was never a program that has dramatically transformed people's lives. Programs don't change us. They can be vehicles to point you to change, but programs don't change you. If a program's worth its salt, it's going to teach you about the Holy Spirit or point you to the Spirit or point you to Jesus. The only thing that can change, will change, can save, will save the Holy Spirit. You see, our community won't be transformed until the church is transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever we do outside these four walls, if we're doing it in our own strength or in our own ingenuity or our own intelligence, it's never going to be as effective as if we did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. When you accept Jesus Christ into your life, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead comes to reside on the inside of you. Amen. That's right. Hallelujah. But I'm talking about a different level of the Holy Spirit. He's there, but we as baby Christians don't understand what it means to have this power within us. But as we begin to unfold and understand that God is offering us gifts that have power, then we begin to understand what the Holy Spirit means to us and what we can do in His power by being powerful witnesses. then God begins to open up this gift of the Holy Spirit. And I know I joke about it all the time. Your pastor loves gifts. I rarely turn one down. But when a gift is given, it's because God wants you to have the fullness. The fullness of life. So that you can live the actual life of Christ, that abundant life that he talked about in John 10.10 for you to live. Why would he offer you half a life? Or half the power to get there? Give you half a tank of gas? He wants to give you everything you need in order to be a successful representation of Jesus on this earth. And if I had to do it in my power, it would never happen. Let's look at the last point. The significance of the fire. Why was that little thing even mentioned that they saw something like tongues of fire dancing on their heads when they received the Holy Spirit? 
Well, we're going to look back and we're going to see that it was actually tied to some Old Testament reasons. But first, let's look at Matthew 3.11. It says, I baptize you with water for repentance. This is John the Baptist talking. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. And he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. See, Acts 2.3 already said that they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. The fire that appeared on the heads of each believer in the upper room has a connection to the Old Testament. You see, when Moses was dedicating the tabernacle, which was the place of worship for the children of Israel while they were wandering in the desert, in Leviticus 9.24 it says, Fire came out of the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and they fell face down. And then look at this. Solomon was actually dedicating the actual temple built in Jerusalem. In 2 Chronicles 7.1 it says, When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of God filled the temple. So what do you think that means? Supernatural fire from heaven. Presence of God fell on the sacrifices. You see, this indicated that the to, pe- to the people that God had accepted the tabernacle and the temple as His dwelling place. The proof of this acceptance was the supernatural fire that fell from heaven. The Apostle Paul uses the term temple to indicate that under the new covenant, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6.19 it says, Do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And I know... A lot of people use this to don't drink, don't smoke, don't do this because your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. No, God wants you to know that His presence dwells on the inside of you. It's not about taking care of your health. Yes, God wants us to be healthy. Yes, we have to be good stewards of what He's given us in our health. But He gave us the Scripture not to tell you to be healthy. He told you to be full of the power of the Holy Spirit. Go out and do the work that I've called you to do in my power, not in yours. See, not only are we the temple of the Holy Spirit, but we're not our own. When we live our lives as a living sacrifice, we no longer have any rights. We give that to God. We lay our lives down like Christ laid His down for us. We lay our life down. We pick up our cross. We follow Him and we become disciples because He gives us the power to become disciples. You see, at Pentecost, the individual believers had the tongues of fire over them, the supernatural fire from heaven. And once again, God sent His fire to demonstrate that from now on, He would accept the temple. We're the temple. He would accept our temple, the church, the people who believe as the dwelling place of His presence. Amen? Amen. John 14, 17 says, The Spirit of truth... The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him for He lives with you and will be in you. You see, we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit when we receive Jesus as our Savior. His Spirit comes to live on the inside of us. That's what makes us new. It's what transforms us. Turns us from that dirty, rotten thing like Shane was saying before to now we're shiny and bright. In the eyes of God, in our own eyes, we still look at the mess, the chaos, the stuff we're in. But when God sees us, He sees us through the filter of the blood of Jesus Christ. And He sees us as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I thank God for the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. I thank God that I have a relationship with Him. I also know that unless I build and maintain my relationship, I can easily have that relationship come to a stop. I said in first service that 
if every night I came home, my loving, beautiful bride would ask, how was your day, honey? And I'd look at her and say, I'm tired. I just want to watch TV and go to bed. If I keep doing that over and over and over again, she's going to look at me like, he must not like me very much. He doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't want to spend time with me. And that relationship is going to suffer. How do you think your relationship with God is? You get home. He's like, son, talk to me. Son, read my word. And you're like, I'm tired, God. I just want to watch TV and go to bed. Your relationship with God is going to suffer. We've got to spend time with Him to maintain this relationship, to maintain the power that He gives us. I heard this story about a New Year's Day uh, parade, the Tournament of Roses in Pasadena, California. And a beautiful float suddenly sputtered and quit. It had ran out of gas. The whole parade was held up until someone could get a can of gas. The funny thing was, is this float represented the Standard Oil Company. (laughs) With this vast oil resources, its truck had run out of gas. We're the Standard Oil Company. We have the oil of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And if we allow His fire to go out, if we allow ourselves to run out of gas and run out of oil, it is our fault. Because we've neglected our relationship with Him. We've neglected our time with Him. We blame the devil for so many things. And yes, he's always roaring like a, like a lion trying to get us. But we blame Him for everything when sometimes we just make our own stupid choices and we make our own choices to call our own shots. We want to spend our time the way we want to spend our time. I'm not saying vacation's bad, people. you got to get a break. But when we choose to keep ourselves away from the house of God and from the family of God, we are working with the devil to cause our own life to have problems. It's in His presence where we're healed. It's in His presence where we're changed. It's in His presence where we have the ability and the family to support us when we're going through hard times. We allow the enemy to separate us, to get us isolated, and then we feel alone and we feel lonely and we don't feel like anybody loves us or cares about us and wants to have anything to do with us because we do it to ourselves. But if we press in, that's why I've been teaching about unity. I've been teaching about the family. I've been teaching about the body. Because we are one. I've been teaching you to be transparent with each other. Tell people when you're having issues so they can pray with you, so they can encourage you. They might have walked a mile in your shoes before and they might be able to give you a word of encouragement. They might be able to give you some advice. More than anything, they if they're a Christian worth their salt, they'll offer to at least pray with you. Okay. Surprised my wife hasn't texted me to tell me to start closing. Too often, we neglect our spiritual maintenance. In Luke 24, 49, it says that we are clothed in power. But even though we're clothed in the power of the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves out of gas because we neglect to maintain. In Leviticus 6, 12. Hey, Rion, would you mind coming and playing the guitar for a minute? In Leviticus 6, 12, instructions were given that the fire that fell from God should never be permitted to go out. It was to be attended constantly around the clock so it would never go out. So should the fire of the Spirit of God in our lives never go out. We should never allow it to go out. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not put out the Spirit's fire. In our church language we use, we say don't quench the Spirit. Which means don't put out the fire of God.
the people of God that are walking in the Spirit should be flowing in His gifts. We should be cherishing His presence and stirring up the fire that He's placed on the inside of us. If we're going to make a difference in this world in the days that we live in, (laughs) I keep telling you, the battle's raging. It's a dark place out there. All you have to do is stick your head out the back door, look up and down the street. If you don't see it on 6th, just walk over to 4th, look up and down, you'll see it. We've got to have the fire of the Holy Spirit in us. Let it transform you, and then we can be the transformative change that our world needs to see. We can become the hands and feet of Jesus. We can do the things that Jesus did and even greater things. I had somebody come up after first service and say, we don't see those things. How can it be true? It's because we're so comfortable here in the United States that we put more faith in the government. We put more faith in our jobs. We put more faith in the doctor than we do in God. I talked about it. Was it last week I was talking about faith, how we put faith in a big metal tube that has these little jet engines on it, and we have faith that it's going to get us from here all the way to the other side of the country. And I put my faith in some guy I don't even know who's flying that big tube that has, in my mind, no reason it should be flying through the air with as much as it weighs. Put so much faith in other things, but we can't believe for the power of the Holy Spirit to be active in our life.